start with a prayer. Okay. <laughs> Let, let's start with a prayer and uh, bow your heads. The love of God has been poured into our hearts through the spirit of the Lord dwelling within us. Sing to God, O kingdoms of the earth. As the Father loves me, so I also love you. Remain in my love, says the Lord. Hallelujah. Okay. So who's going to introduce our speaker? Craig? Uh, sure. Uh, yeah, Herb Brownett, Brownett, I guess we all, most of us know him. Uh, he took a, uh, a, a band of brothers tour uh, of all the D-Day sites in 19, in uh, uh, 2015. It was uh, sponsored by, <clears throat> or it was run by a uh, uh, Stephen Ambrose uh, travel company. And Stephen Ambrose was a uh, very well-known author of Band of Brothers, which was a uh, uh, well-known book on uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, a, 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 an acclaimed D-Day book. Um, about and it was turned into a documentary about a uh, parachute infantry company uh, from the uh, 21st or 101st Airborne uh, that spearheaded the invasion of the uh, uh, Nazi-held Nazi Europe. And uh, Herb took that tour in 2015. He's an amateur uh, uh, photographer, and he's going to show us uh, a lot of the photographs from that tour. Um, so, Herb, it's all yours. Okay, Ted, drum roll here. <clears throat> all right, hopefully Perfect. everybody sees. Perfect. Huh? You, you, you did it flawlessly, okay. Herb. All right. So, um, Yes, uh, as Craig was saying, Stephen Ambrose was, a, was he's passed away. He was a preeminent World War II historian. Uh, he got his uh, fame by writing a definitive uh, biography of Eisenhower. Uh, this is his book on D-Day, which is considered uh, one of the better uh, sources of, of the whole battle. Uh, he was also, uh, he founded the uh, World War II History Museum in New Orleans. He was a professor at the University of New Orleans. And it's on the site of the uh, Higgins Boat Works. And I'll discuss the significance of that later. Um, he's written a number of books about World War II. Uh, he, he mentioned Band of Brothers. Um, and uh, another one is Pegasus Bridge about uh, attacking a bridge on D-Day, which I'll cover that. Uh, he also wrote um, another really good book is uh, Wobbly Yonder, which is uh, about the bomber pilot career of George McGovern. So uh, he's, uh, he's one of all time great World War II historians. Uh, as you could probably tell from my bookcase uh, that you saw in my uh, background there, um, I am also an amateur historian uh, and one of my areas of interest is World War II. I, I believe that you really, to really understand uh, the history, uh, particularly of battles, you have to visit the sites. Uh, I've been to most of the uh, major Civil War sites, Revolutionary War sites, and a few other interesting places like the Alamo, Pearl Harbor, and Custer's Battlefield. Um, so this was, a, uh, this was a bucket list item, trip of a lifetime for me, and I'm uh, looking forward to sharing it with you. Just to, uh, just to put where we're going to go into context, um, D-Day was uh, the largest uh, seaborne invasion in history. Uh, the Allies landed 156,000 combat troops on a well-defended hostile shore in one day. It involved over 6,900 ships and landing craft, and over 10,000 airplanes flew 25,000 sorties all within 24 hours. Uh, Allied Supreme Commander was Dwight Eisenhower. The U.S. Commander was Omar Bradley. The British Commander was Bernard Montgomery. And the German Commander was Erwin, Erwin Rommel, uh, a.k.a. the Desert Fox, um, generally thought to be the greatest tactical general of World War II. 
unfortunately he was on the wrong side of history and and not fighting for a good cause and, uh, the meeting was originally the i mean the invasion was originally scheduled for june 5 and it was moved to june 6 due to the weather and i'll i'll talk about that so uh so the, the Normandy area, uh, the area of the invasion was from just north of this little crook uh, to just past Con right here. The Allies really had two choices for cho cross-channel invasion. One was the Pas de Calais, the other was Normandy. Uh, through um, an inc incredible uh, illusionary effort, uh, they had the Germans absolutely convinced they were attacking Calais. That's a whole other story and I won't go any further, but. Uh, the second logical place was uh, was Normandy. It's, you could get to Paris quickly. Uh, one of the objectives of any landing was to get to a, a major port, a secure a major port, and that would be Cherbourg. So the idea was to uh, land here, uh, cut across the uh, Bhutan Peninsula of Normandy, isolate Cherbourg and get that port and then uh, expand from there. The actual landing plan, uh, this is the battlefield. Uh, one thing that impresses you when you get there is uh, you tend to think, because Hollywood you know, focuses on small things, that it's not that big an area. Well, from the, from the north end of Utah Beach uh, to the uh, Warren River over here, uh, which was the, the landing area, is over 60 miles. And uh, Omaha Beach alone is five miles wide. Uh, but the fighting was not all uh, across the whole beach. Uh, in the case of uh, Omaha Beach, there were there they had uh, very high bluffs, and you had to attack uh, what they call draws or ravines. There were so that you could get uh, your men and armor off the beach in the in the two. It was at Beerville and Colville, so there's towns uh, where these places are logically, and. Uh, part of that story is, is that it was so obvious that if they, they, uh, the Allies attacked this area that they had to seize those ravines that uh, Rommel, being uh, a good general, had. they were heavily, heavily fortified. Uh, another key point was Pont de Hoc, that is a protrusion of land. Uh, the Germans had man, uh, mounted a very large guns on that uh, point that could hit both Omaha Beach and Utah Beach and ships at sea, and it needed to be, it needed to be uh, seized. And that was done by Army Rangers. And all, all these places I'm talking about, I'm gonna have pictures. Now, the, uh, the, the first point is, uh, the first objective uh, of the Allies was to secure the flanks of the invasion. And that meant securing uh, this critical town of saint mary Lise. It was on the road from Cherbourg to keep troops from moving down into the Normandy area. Uh, it's surrounded by lowlands, which Rommel had flooded, and there were causeways from Utah Beach, and so uh, there was a parachute drop on the night of D-Day. And if you saw the Band of Brothers series, they, they were involved in that. Uh, on the other end of the line, uh, they wanted to, uh, there was at, uh, at Beneville on the uh, Oren River, uh, Odin River, there's a uh, key bridge and it was assigned to the British paratroop, uh, para, uh, glider paratroopers to land uh, the night, the, the early morning of D-Day and seize that bridge. And if we, if the Allies could control those two key points, uh, the, the uh, the ability for the Germans to counterattack within the first 24 to 48 hours would be, would be uh, severely limited. Uh, a secondary objective as soon as possible was to seize a uh, Carantan, which you can see is also uh, a major crossroads. Uh, so that gives, that just gives some geographical uh, context. Uh, one of the places I'll mention is um, Aramange, uh, the, one of the uh, innovations in the Allies was Mulberry Harbors. These were big artificial harbors. They built big floating concrete caissons that could be sunk to form an artificial harbor. And they had two of those, one in Aramange and one uh, at Bureville. 
and I'll talk more about that later. So anyway, that's your geography. So as I go through this, you'll have an idea of where these places are. Uh, these were our tour guides. Uh, the gentleman on the ref, uh, left, Kevin Heimel, uh, is a World War II historian of some eminence. He's considered uh, one of the leading experts on patent. And he, uh, he was also had the distinction when the, when the Band of Brothers series was so successful, Dick Winters was pressed to write his autobiography. And he was uh, getting on in years and he really didn't, wasn't capable of doing all the research. So Kevin was his research assistant. Kevin knows how to get in and out of uh, military archives and find all the records. He also had the pleasure of uh, interviewing every one of the living band of brothers uh, before they passed away. Uh, the, the ones that were still alive when the show came out, he interviewed every one of them. So he knows a lot about them. He had great stories. This gentleman is Casey Bowery. He's a retired Brigadier General. He, uh, during his career, interestingly enough, uh, when he was a major, he was assigned to the White House for two years, and he was one of the people that uh, carried the football for President Ronald Reagan. He had a lot of great stories about wonder, what a wonderful, uh, warm person Ronald Reagan was. But he was the military expert, so every time we were going to a site, he ended out a military map, he explained the strategy, he explained what they were trying to do. And then when we got there, Kevin had great stories about uh, what the people did when they were there. Terrific team. So we started in London. Our first stop was uh, Norfolk House. This was the Supreme Allied Command headquarters uh, where most of the invasion was planned. And uh, near there, they have a nice uh, statue of Ike. We then went to the Churchill War Rooms. Uh, if you ever go to London, I, I think this is the number one spot to go see. These, uh, this is an underground complex that was built uh, near the start of the war. It's about a block and a half from number 10 Downing Street, where uh, Churchill and the prime ministers to this day live. And it was built under a government office building that was fairly new. It was steel construction and it had a, a solid concrete slab. They excavated under it and added about another four or five feet of reinforced concrete. So in theory, it could stand a direct hit. Um, and uh, at the end of the war, uh, it was locked. People just got up, took their stuff, left, left papers, everything, maps, walked out and they locked it up. And everybody kind of forgot about it for about 30 years. And then as the next uh, generation of, of People came along that were interested in the war, like me. Um, somebody remembered it was there. They went and unlocked it, and they found the original maps, the original furniture, a lot of notes. They found a, uh, a burned-out cigar in Churchill's ashtray. Uh, amazing place. And so they, they turned it into a museum. They did a nice job. And uh, this is one of the, this is uh, this is Churchill's personal phone booth. Uh, one of the phones was directly connected to a phone on the direct on the desk of FDR, Franklin Roosevelt. And, uh, and they spoke uh, practically every day for the war. He obviously wouldn't leave the door open, but uh, anyway, that's, that's where he went. Uh, this is the main conference room. This is where all the serious planning was done by all the uh, top brass in Churchill. The place is just an absolute labyrinth of all these places. They also have sleeping quarters. It's multi-level. It's two levels and they have all these little cubicles and a lot of people would stay uh, for the evening and uh, if, they, if they needed to and they even had a place, uh, Churchill had a cot there. Very interesting place. Next, we went to the uh, Imperial War Museum. This is their military uh, Smithsonian, if you will. Uh, a lot of interesting exhibits. Uh, this is a fine example of a Sherman tank, which was the primary American tank in World War II. Uh, they were lightweight, they were fast, they were easy to build and maintain, uh, and they had them in large numbers. Uh, they were also very vulnerable because they were light and the Germans had heavy guns on their tanks. And uh, the tank crews um, nicknamed them Ronsons because if you hit one, it went off like a cigarette lighter. Uh, if you ever want to read some really uh, hairy stuff about uh, real combat in World War II, read 
read uh, accounts from uh, tankers. All right, we left London. Our next stop was Bletchley, House, uh, Bletchley Park. Uh, you may recognize this. This is where the code breakers were. Uh, if you've seen the movie The Unseen, uh, that's, uh, I mean, uh, The Imitation Game, uh, that's, this is where uh, that took place uh, as is typical of Hollywood. It's a gross over, oversimplification. And it's a fascinating story. I took a bunch of pictures, which I'm not gonna show you because we'd never get to Normandy. But if you would like for me to come back to one of these meetings sometime and tell you about Bletchley Park, I will. And just as a little sweetener, uh, as they developed uh, the technology to break the code, they invented the modern computer. So whatever you're watching this presentation on, its original roots were right here. Next stop was uh, Suffolk House. It's spelled, if you read it, you'd say it's Southwick, but the British pronounce it Suffolk. Uh, this is, was the officer's, it still is the officer's club on a Marine, British Marine base, um, just right outside of Portsmouth, England. Portsmouth was the main disembarkation area or embarkation area for the invasion. Uh, Eisenhower wanted to, as they got near the end for a couple, last couple months, he wanted to be near the preparations but he also uh, wanted to get his staff out of London so they would be uh, out of the bars and away from the young ladies where they could A, focus on their job, but B, not be a security risk. Because uh, one of the great, probably the greatest security achievement of, of D-Day really was keeping the, the location secret from the Germans. They really didn't know it was Normandy. Front of the building. Now, this room, in, in the uh, building. Uh, in this room occurred one of the most consequential military decisions in history. The invasion, as I mentioned before, the invasion was uh, originally uh, meant to take place on June 5th. Uh, they had a, uh, a weatherman assigned to the, uh, to the top brass. His name was Captain James Stagg of the RAF. And on, on June, early on June 5th, they started in motion ships leaving harbor, loaded with men, loaded with supplies to, uh, to launch uh, the meeting, actually on June 4th. And he came along and he said, wait a minute, guys, uh, the weather doesn't look good and uh, it, you're not going to be able to land troops on June 5th. And so they said, well, how's June 6th look? Now they particularly wanted to land when the moon was full because the moonlight would give the airborne pilots and the glider pilots light to see where they were. And, but also the tides would be higher. And there was only about three days a month when that worked and it was June 5th to 7th. So they said, well, how the next two days look? And uh, keep in mind in those days, they did not have satellites. They did not have computer, uh, computer models. He, uh, he was relying on reports from ships at sea, from buoys out in the ocean about uh, conditions, planes flying around, gathering atmospheric uh, information. And, uh, and he hand drew this map, this, this, uh, this weather map and this uh, projection. He also drew one for June 7th. And he went back to Eisenhower and the senior commanders and he said, uh, for to my forecast, uh, the weather uh, on June 6th will be marginal, but you can land on June 7th. It, it won't be possible. There's a window of opportunity. So how would you like to be that guy with that technology? Thousands of lives are at stake. Uh, you know, the, the future of Western civilization and everybody's relying on your forecast. Um, makes Cecily Times job look pretty easy, doesn't it? Uh, but anyway, so in this room, in this very room, there was a long conference table. Ike was sitting at the end. They think about where this uh, plastic starts, this floor starts. And uh, they all talked about it and, the, and the, uh, all the commanders, the, the, the major command, they were kind of split on what to do. And it came down to Eisenhower's decision. And he sat there for about two minutes and didn't say anything. And then a very low, uh, even voice, he said, okay, let's go. 
and people scattered like you know dove because they had to get to their commands and they launched the invasion on june 6 as you know it was successful and it actually worked out for the allies because the germans were were uh, so convinced that uh, the weather would not allow a, a, an invasion for the next few days that Rommel left and went to Berlin for his wife's birthday, which turned out to be critical, as well as another number of other commanders. Um, so they, they really did uh, catch the Germans off guard. We then uh, left Portsmouth by ferry and crossed. Uh, here we are arriving at the French coast. This is the entrance to Cherbourg Harbor. Uh, and we made it basically the same route that uh, the invasion fleet did. Uh, we were lucky we had a nice calm day on the channel. Our first stop in Normandy was uh, San Mariglis, that crossroads town. And uh, this is the church in the town. And it's this is a town square that goes out uh, to the left here. Uh, if you've seen the movie, The Longest Day, this is excellent, uh, an excellent movie, you know that our, our, some of our paratroopers overshot their landing zone and actually landed in the square in the middle of uh, Germans. And uh, there was quite a fierce battle uh, in the square uh, and around the square. Uh, you may also remember from the movie, a uh, character played by Red Buttons, a parachutist uh, got his parachute caught on the church. Uh, you can see right here, there's a little parachute dummy. I'll show you more of him in a minute, but they, uh, the folks in this town, uh, who live a lot on uh, D-Day tourism, I really play it up. Uh, you, may, you may also know that uh, as a result of uh, anti-aircraft, German anti-aircraft fire falling into one of the buildings, uh, one of the buildings on the square caught tire fire. The Germans allowed the uh, citizens to break curfew and come out and fight the fire. That all they could do was this pump and a bucket brigade and that's the actual pump. Here's our paratrooper, better shot of him. The, uh, the real, and he did, he played dead. He played like he was dead and the Germans ignored him and he got rescued the next day. All right, this is our tour group. Uh, this gentleman right here holding the end of the flag was an attorney from Tennessee. One of his uncles was on a naval ship on D-Day and uh, this was a, the flag flown by that ship on that day. And his uncles, um, his cousins asked him to take the flag to Normandy and take pictures of it wherever they went. And we did a, I took advantage of a group shot here in, in front of the church. You may recognize that good looking guy right there. Okay, uh, there's battle damage on the church. These, all these pock marks are, are, are bullet holes. There was a lot of fighting around the church. You can go in the church. It's a lovely little church, uh, as all the churches in Normandy are. Uh, this is the parking lot area, and this is where you know, it's, they now park cars where all, all the fighting went on. Next stop was Utah Beach. Uh, as you can see from the weather, it was uh, blustery and rainy, uh, much like the weather at the time of the invasion. Utah Beach, as you can see, is uh, it's low lying. Uh, it's, uh, it doesn't have steep bluffs. It was uh, easy to get off the beach, uh, so to speak. But the key was, um, as I mentioned earlier, the inland area had been flooded by Rama, and they had they had to seize causeways. Uh, one of those, uh, what they call the fog of war events, is the American landing craft actually got blown off course. And they landed here, which is about um, a mile, over a mile south of where they were supposed to be for a main causeway. Uh, they were led uh, on the ground by the number two commander in their corps, which was General Theodore Roosevelt Jr., son of Teddy Roosevelt. And he came ashore and he had to make a decision on the spot. Do we try to move to where we're supposed to be? And everybody thinks we are. Or do we, this is lightly defended and there is a smaller causeway here, do we move inland? And he made the famous decision uh, he said, he thought about it, he said, okay, let's start the war right here and they moved inland. Uh, and he, he personally led from the front and was awarded the Medal of Honor for that. Uh, if you've seen The Longest Day, that role is played by one of my favorite all-time actors, uh, Henry Fonda. 
this is what uh, they had these uh, length obstacles on all the beaches. Uh, they were actually longer than this. They, they cut this one down, but they were, uh, they looked like a giant kid's jack. And if, if the Lallas had tried to land at high tide, they would have ripped the bottom out of the landing uh, craft. Uh, this is the Higgins Boat Monument. Higgins boats were the primary landing craft of World War II. Sorry about that. Um, anyway, uh, Dwight Eisenhower, when he uh, said that the Higgins boat was the uh, most significant innovation of World War II in terms of uh, the Normandy landings, Higgins was a boat builder in New Orleans, Louisiana. He built uh, lightweight wooden boats for use in the bayous. And when the government uh, put out requests to, to design some, some type of landing craft, he took one of his boats, he cut the bow off, he knew he had to get people off in a hurry. He put a ramp on the front. Uh, they're made out of plywood, which makes them cheap and easy to build, but also easy to carry. You can get a whole bunch of these on a troop transport. The only piece of steel on this boat is, is the uh, ramp, because you were uh, coming into a shore uh, frequently where people are shooting at you. And this is where uh, Roosevelt said, let's go. This is a monument to Dick Winters, uh, Easy Company, 506 Regiment, 101st Airborne Division, uh, known as the Band of Brothers. Uh, they performed a significant deed on D-Day, which I'll talk about later, uh, which helped secure the beach, and they have this monument to them. Next stop, this was south of San Mariglis. Uh, this is a bridge called uh, La Ferrer Bridge. This, this was the main road from the south into San Mariglis, and they, the Germans launched a, a major uh, counteroffensive up that road on uh, D-Day and the, on the following day. And uh, the, the 101st Airborne, including elements of Easy Company, uh, fought here and fought them off. These fields would have been all flooded, so they had to, they had to go over this causeway, uh, which narrowed their opportunities. The, uh, the lightly armed uh, airborne troops, because they can't carry a lot of stuff, uh, did a marvelous job fending off the Germans. And they, uh, they earned the nickname Iron Mikes. Uh, you have GI Joes, but if you're an Iron Mike, you were a, a paratrooper. And uh, this is the Iron Mike uh, monument at that location. All right, this is a, uh, a historical chateau where we stayed during our four days in Normandy. Uh, interestingly enough, when Rommel, it, it's near uh, Utah Beach, when Rommel came to visit the, uh, the defenses at Utah Beach, he actually stayed at this, at this chateau. Uh, it, uh, we, we ate our, our meals in there and some of the folks stayed in there. Uh, over on the left was a, a modern hotel building, but I was a single. So those of us who were uh, singles, uh, we got to stay in a carriage house. And uh, that was my room right there. It, it was kind of cool, except that was the only window, a little claustrophobic. Nice thing is when I got up and left in the morning, the bus was about 20 feet over here. All right, our second day in Normandy starts at uh, Pegasus Bridge. This is that key bridge to secure the left flank of the Allied armies. And it was uh, assigned to the Pegasus Brigade. That is, was a uh, former cavalry brigade that became glider troops and they adopted the emblem of Pegasus, the Greek wing god of a warrior uh, to represent their brigade. Uh, they did such a fine job that it is now known as a Pegasus Bridge. Here's the bridge. This is the town of Bonneville. Um, this, uh, this was led by uh, Major John Howard, uh, was the commander. The, uh, interestingly enough, if you've seen the movie The Longest Day, uh, a popular British actor, when that was made, uh, Richard Todd played John Howard. But Richard Todd was actually a soldier on this mission. He actually, uh, he actually fought here. And the, uh, what happened was, um, this is the field where the, the lead glider with Howard uh, and the lead troops landed. Uh, it is that close to the bridge. 
Now, these gliders were big wooden and canvas clumsy things that were very heavy. They weren't very nimble. They were dropped off. Uh, they had no motor. Uh, so the glider pilot uh, navigated. He could see the moonlight on the river and he coasted down and they made a U-turn around the town and he landed this close to the bridge. Uh, British Air Marshal Lee Mallory said it's the single greatest flying feat of World War II. Uh, they piled out of the glider. You can see how close they were to the village. Uh, they immediately seized this gun and, uh, and took over the bridge in, in very short order. Uh, the Germans were just totally surprised. Now, the, this is uh, the famed German 88. Uh, it was designed as an anti-aircraft gun, but it could be used for against tanks and personnel. It was very, very fast firing and very lethal. Now, after the paratroopers secured the bridge, they saw twinkling lights in this building. Uh, they thought someone was shooting at them, so they started shooting shells at it. And then they noticed some, some people walk out of the building very calmly and walk along this bank, and they didn't look like troops, so they quit firing. The closer they got, they saw that they were actually nuns. And the nuns walked up to the town, walked up across the bridge, and very politely said, Would you, we're glad you're here, but would you please quit firing your gun at us because uh, we're nuns and that's our nunnery and that's where we live. These are the great little stories you get when you go on, when you go on a tour like that. So you cross the bridge into Benneville. Uh, this is a famous cafe. Uh, Marion uh, is run by uh, Monsieur and Madame Gondre. Uh, the Madame Gondre uh, was a middle-aged woman, charming. She was she spoke German. She was very nice to the German soldiers that, uh, that were guarding the bridge and, and uh, treated them kindly and chatted it up with them and gathered a lot of valuable intelligence for the uh, allies about the, about the bridge. Uh, their daughter Arlette was seven at the time of the of the thing uh, of the attack. She did. They attended. She, her husband, and her daughter attended the bridge uh, wounded and. Uh, Richard Todd, the actor, actually met uh, Arlette and they became uh, lifelong friends. Now, the bridge over the river now is not the original bridge. They had to replace it after a while and this is the original bridge. It's uh, off, off on the side. Now we went to the, we went to the British beach zone, the British Canadian beach zone, uh, where there were a number of towns right up against the beach. Uh, nice little uh, beach towns, uh, not unlike the uh, Jersey Shore. And uh, you can see uh, life goes on. Uh, there are beaches and people treat them like beaches. They're not really particularly historical sites uh, at the moment. But we went and saw them. Uh, cute little uh, seaside villages uh, behind these. Uh, this is Aramanche, uh, where I said one of the Mulberry Harbor sites. Uh, these are remnants of the Mulbet. These are uh, concrete case on uh, harbor uh, that, that still exist. Uh, you can see them. There was, they were in a big arc out there. And uh, they'll probably just stay there. And that's the town. So uh, here's the beach into the town. Now, they, they had these uh, prefabricated steel causeways uh, that they linked together and uh, put on uh, fl floating pontoons that went out to the caissons. So the ships would come into the harbor, dock at one of the caissons, unload right onto trucks, and they'd run them off up on the beach and off you go, because uh, keeping 160,000 combat troops uh, fed and medicine and ammunition and all requires a lot of logistics. And this was the primary you know, way they did it until they could see shearboard. Um, there was a, uh, a significant channel storm uh, a few weeks after the invasion that wrecked the Omaha Mulberry. Uh, interestingly enough, that storm happened at the time that the invasion would have been rescheduled for had they not gone on June 6th. This further affirmation of Ike's decision. Next stop is uh, Omaha Beach. Uh, this is uh, one of the two draws, Beerville, uh, which is, this is the section of beach where the opening scene of Saving Private Ryan took place. And according to our general tour, uh, the general who was our tour guide, that's a pretty accurate representation of uh, what it was probably like. 
you can see it's a, it's a big wide beach. Uh, these are the bluffs. So you hear about the bluff, but you don't really realize how high and how steep they are until you see it. So it was uh, pretty scary to um, attack these uh, in an area where the Germans knew you were coming. Uh, Allied intelligence uh, was said that these, this was defended by uh, troops that were pressed into service uh, from Eastern European uh, countries that had been uh, inscripted. They, they were inscripted from Eastern European countries that had been conquered. Uh, the Allies did not know that two weeks before the invasion, uh, the uh, Germans rotated in the 352nd Regiment, uh, Panzer Regiment, which was a crack outfit that had been fighting in Russia. And so not only were they confronted with these bluffs, but they were confronted with uh, the best soldiers that the Germans had. That house, by the way, is built on the, I understand, is built on the foundation of a pillbox. Uh, so, yeah, you see this enclosure over here, uh, this, this place had awesome uh, defenses. As you can see, it's a big wide beach. Uh, I thought this was a really cool monument, you know, saluting the men that assaulted uh, Omaha Beach. Uh, once again, it is, it is a beach town and you have uh, houses along here, but you can see how wide it is, how tall those bluffs are, and that's the the gap that they're, they're trying to capture. There's that uh, bunker again. Another bunker right down on the beach. And notice how these are angled. They're angled for to give to give uh, a cross field of fire down the beach, but also to make it harder for uh, to hit them from the sea. Uh, went up to this bunker and uh, that's what it looked like on the inside. And uh, this was the line of sight. So they had an 88 in that bunker, fat, once again, fast firing any personnel weapon. And this was their, in, in you know, where our soldiers are trying to come across this stretch of beach right here. And you can see that until uh, this gun was knocked out, how much uh, damage they could do protected on the sides. This is, uh, this is further along uh, Omaha Beach. Um, this, uh, this is a very interesting bunker. Uh, this is a famous D-Date uh, picture, uh, which shows that bunker right there, shows our troops marching off the beach. Uh, just about every book about D-Day has this picture. And I took this picture from the very same spot that that picture was taken from, uh, which I thought was pretty cool that the tour guide uh, pointed out that you could do that. Remnants of an 88, you can see uh, somebody got a shell in there uh, during the battle, knocked a hole in the wall. Uh, now, this, uh, now we're moving down to Coles, uh, Colville. Uh, this hill is where a lot of the fortifications were. Uh, this little, uh, I just found this of local interest. Uh, these guys were uh, going to go out fishing in this little boat, and they had their tractor to get it across the beach. And when I travel, I always look for unusual things like that. So, uh, this is the beach shingles, which uh, are famous because the soldiers try to reach them and lay down on them, and, and they are small rocks. I actually picked up a couple and brought them home, which they don't mind. Once again, trying to fight your way across this beach and get up these bluffs. There's a close up of the shingle. pillbox lower down along the, the, the uh, beach. This shows a little, uh, there, there were some little ruts along the way uh, that, that somebody could climb. So they did have uh, defenses around that, a machine gun nest or two. Now this location right here, uh, this is another famous picture of D-Day. Troops huddled under there uh, waiting for reinforcements so they could move up. And uh, this is exactly where that picture was taken.
and we move away, you can see uh, the valley down there. So we're at Colville. Uh, this is the uh, fortifications overlooking the beach. Uh, this is the ravine, so the allies are trying to seize this. And they've had this hill heavily fortified, all types of uh, bunkers, trenches, some of which are filled in. That was uh, probably a machine gun nest. Pretty commanding view. Uh, this is another famous picture uh, from World War II, and uh, this is the uh, this is the place uh, in the picture. There's a couple of my uh, tour buddies, and this is the view out of that little enclosure. So once again, if you're in here with uh, rifles and machine guns, oh, you got a pretty good uh, sweep of the beach there. Also, that's a heavy gun emplacement. That's a track to rotate a heavy gun, so they had heavy guns up here. All right, this was uh, one of the most special parts, uh, two, two of my favorite parts of the tour. This is the American Cemetery at Colville. If you've seen the movie Saving Private Ryan, it opens in this mood at this place and it closes at this. Uh, it is, uh, it, it's, a, it's a very moving place. Uh, now what our tour guide is doing, uh, he brought some sand and a bottle of water up and you're allowed to do this. Uh, the crosses are all engraved with white. So if you want to see the name on it, uh, you can rub uh, this wet sand on it and it'll show up for a little while on this. That's what he did there. Um, just now, uh, you heard me mention Theodore Roosevelt Jr. and what he did on Utah Beach on D-Day. Uh, in, in early July, about three or four weeks after D-Day, he was promoted to a Corps commander and a few days later, he uh, died of a heart attack. Uh, as indicated in the movie, The Longest Day, he did have serious health issues. Uh, and he did win the Medal of Honor, as did his father, Teddy Roosevelt, their only father's son to win the Medal of Honor. Now, uh, before Teddy Roosevelt, uh, he, he had uh, requested that if he didn't survive the war, he would like to be brother, buried with his brother, Quentin. Quentin was... Um, the youngest of four Roosevelt boys, he uh, died in World War One. He was an aviator and he was shot down and killed. And he was buried in a World War One cemetery. Well, um, oops. All right, let me skip ahead a little bit. I apologize. I don't have the picture here. I thought I did. But anyway. Um, the next grave over is Quentin's, rather than move Roosevelt to World War I cemetery, they moved Quentin to here, and he's the only uh, person buried in this cemetery that did not uh, die in World War II. Uh, now, uh, these two graves, uh, the Nyland brothers, one killed on uh, D-Day, one killed the next day. Uh, you know them better by their last name of Ryan. Uh, these are the, are the Saving Private Ryan was based on a true story. And these two brothers uh, were uh, killed. The son had, the family had four sons. One of them was an aviator in the Pacific who was uh, shot down and presumed and killed uh, in, in the, uh, over um, uh, Borneo in, in World War, at, at about the same time. So they actually did go out and pull uh, the other son off the line and send him home. Uh, but these are the two brothers that are buried. Uh, Somewhat happy ending of the story when the war ended, uh, the other brother did show up. It turned out he was captured by the Japanese and he survived as a POW. And so they really only lost two sons, not three sons, but how terrible is that? Just, um, I know I have a lot of pictures, but I just found the place just so moving and uh, such a tribute to our generation that uh, we sent so many men and they were willing to, and, and women, there were ladies there too, um, anybody who died in Normandy, regardless of the causes, uh, was, was buried here. Uh, they do, they, this is actually a prayer trap chapel where you can go in and, and contemplate and pray. They have a nice little altar in there. A nice reflection pool. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a statue uh, symbolizing uh, youth or rising up to, uh, to conquer evil. 
I'm going to stop on this slide for a minute uh, as we come upon Memorial Day. Uh, we should all reflect on this in places like this, because that's really what Memorial Day is like. Uh, we live in the greatest country in the history of the world, and it's in no small part due to the sacrifices made by our military over many wars. All right, this is another one of those uh, great to have a tour guide adventures. Uh, we went down this little road and uh, we came to a place called Breakwater Manor. Uh, if you've seen Band of Brothers, you know that on D-Day, uh, E Company, uh, they attacked a gun battery. It was three miles behind Utah Beach, four guns entrenched, shelling uh, Utah Beach. And their assignment, they were supposed to have 100 uh, men assigned to take this, only 12 managed to gather after the scattered parachute landings and uh, led by uh, Dick Winters, they successfully uh, captured a battery manned by 60 Germans. Uh, they they uh, killed or ran off all the Germans and destroyed the guns. And that's why there's a Dick Winters monument on Utah Beach. Uh, if you've seen Band of Brothers, you know they say at the end that uh, it's it was uh, it's that that engagement is still studied at West Point as a, as a classic way to attack a fixed gun position. So this is our tour guide once again, Kevin. Uh, he he spends the summer in Europe uh, looking for historical sites. He actually located this site. This is not on any tourist map. Uh, the only people that go there are people on his tour. He just he figured out where it was. He went up to the chateau, the little chateau farmhouse, knocked on the door a few years back and asked uh, the old farmer who came in. He said, uh, according to my calculations, this is the field where a gun battery was. He goes, you're right, I was a little boy. And he took him out and he showed it to him. Uh, and uh, here's the actual field. The guns were uh, entrenched along this tree line here, firing uh, to the right. Uh, and uh, Kevin asked him and said, I like to bring uh, tours here uh, two or three times a summer. And the farmer said, yeah, as long as you call me ahead of time and let me know you're here, that's fine. And so anyway, that was a real treat. Uh, that's, you, you don't, if you just go to Normandy by yourself, you're not gonna see things like this. You know? uh, okay, the, uh, I mentioned before that the, uh, the next objective after D-Day and after defending some air lease was to seize the crossroads of Carantan. Uh, and if this looks familiar, um, if you saw the Band of Brothers, uh, they actually did attack down this road and that, uh, that bar in that building was there and they actually filmed uh, the, uh, that sequence right here on this road. And there, if you get up close to the building, there's still some bullet holes there. All right, our next stop is Ponta Hoc. Remember, that's a uh, piece of land jutting out with uh, big guns on it. Uh, this is actually a naval shell crater from a battleship. That's how big a hole they leave. Uh, here's the point. Now, uh, if you don't know the story, uh, I'll tell you the story in a minute. You know, another shell hole. Just They just pulverized the place, but they still knew. Uh, they didn't have accurate bombing and fire in those days, and they knew that they had to uh, capture it. Uh, this, is, this is the remains of one of the gun placements. You can see the track where the gun was. Now, um, after seizing uh, the battery, or they, they, they fought their way up a cliff, which I'll show you in a minute, and they discovered the guns had been removed. And uh, the Germans had pulled them back uh, a couple hundred yards from the beach. Uh, two different uh, groups of two soldiers uh, went uh, looking for them and found them and was able to disable them. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, the Germans uh, counterattacked vigorously. It was two days before this outfit was relieved and there was a lot of fighting across this area back and forth for two days until, uh, until they got relieved. I'm gonna move along here. Okay, this is the actual point. 
Uh, this this uh, paved area right here is where uh, Ronald Reagan gave his famous speech uh, on the, uh, I think it was the 30th anniversary of, of D-Day, uh, 30th or 25th, something like that. But anyway, and there's a monument right at this, that's the very tip of the point. This is an intact gun placement uh, facility. You can see how well fortified they were. And uh, they were pretty much bomb proof unless you could get something in that door there. This is looking down uh, at the point. Monument to the Rangers. There's a pillbox at the top that it took them a while to see. These things are pretty claustrophobic as you can see. Uh, Now, this is the cliff they assaulted. So that's over 100 feet high. Uh, this, uh, obviously the uh, erosion proof fencing was not there. Uh, and uh, they shot uh, ropes and grappling hooks up this thing and climbed up it with the Germans shooting at them and dropping grenades on them. Uh, one of the uh, truly amazing feats of arms of World War II. And you can just, you can just, I can't imagine just trying to do that. That's another, that's a, a huge bomb crater. So you get the idea, the place was pretty substantial. Now this is interesting. Uh, when they were moving the guns, one of them fell off uh, the device they were carrying it on. And uh, on D-Day, they had not gotten around to, uh, to moving it. So it was just laying on the ground. And uh, the other guns were actually blown up. This, this is one of those original guns, so you can see how big they were and why they were concerned about them. All right, this is uh, one of the saddest places, but probably the saddest place. We, this is the German, Norman Cemetery, you know, Normandy Cemetery. Um, very somber place, kind of has a dark feel. Uh, there's a sadness to it because these people, uh, you know, they died in, in a, terrible cause that was lost. Uh, and uh, just uh, gives you cause for reflection. Uh, you'll note a lot of the graves are just markers on the ground. Um, this is an example. This, this poor guy was 18 years old. He had his whole life in front of him and, uh, and he died uh, you know, for the terrible uh, Hitler regime. Uh, in, in, a, in a useless effort. It's just really sad. Uh, this is something else interesting. This is five soldiers that are buried, married together. Uh, apparently it's a uh, Teutonic warrior tradition that if a group of soldiers die together, they're buried together. So this was probably maybe a tank crew uh, or some group of soldiers and, and they died at the same time. So they buried them together. And then here's an unknown shoulder just says, uh, a German soldier, that's what it says. That's all it is. Outside the cemetery, as you leave, they have the flags of all the allies, but the German flag and the flag of the European Union to uh, just to say uh, as you're leaving, um, it's over, we're all together now. All right, this was my favorite part of the tour. And once again, this is the kind of thing you don't get unless you go on a good tour. This small uh, church uh, in a small Norman town, Normandy town, and, and every town has one of these stone churches. Uh, it was built, ironically, in the year 1066. If that date sounds familiar, it was the day of the last cross-channel invasion, uh, successful cross-channel invasion by William Conqueror. And he was responsible for building a lot of these churches. Uh, he was a pretty powerful guy, and, uh, and uh, people were you know, pretty religious at the time. Anyway. Uh, fierce fighting went on all around this church between the Airborne and the German church troops. This is, uh, this is in the uh, San Mariglis area. And so uh, two, German, uh, two American paratroopers who were medics set up uh, an aid station in the church and started treating the wounded. Uh, the, uh, they laid them on the pews. Uh, these are bloodstains from the war. Uh, 70 something years later, uh, the parishioners felt like it was important to leave that there uh, as a reminder of what went on here. Uh, and uh, it's, it's just a quaint little church. Uh, 
two very interesting stories. First, at the height of the battle, uh, and they treated German wounded too. At the height of the battle, a squad of Germans uh, burst through the door, ready to mow everybody down. Uh, they stopped. They saw what was going on. They saw German wounded uh, being treated to. Uh, the German in charge of the group uh, saluted the medics and formally saluted the medics and they backed out the door. Uh, but the best story is um, at the height of the battle, a German mortar shell came through the roof. That's the hole. It struck this the floor right here. Uh, some of you may recognize this picture. I submitted this in the uh, church uh, photo exhibits uh, a few years ago as, as something was meaningful to me. The mortar shell struck right in the middle of a bunch of wounded and did not detonate. Um, the people of the church have not repaired the floor. They believe it was a miracle performed by God. Uh, cynics might say, well, uh, a lot of German munitions were made by uh, impressed people and you know they had a lot of duds, but uh, I prefer the former explanation that it was an act of God. So here we are, we're leaving Normandy. It's a beautiful area. The people are wonderful. Uh, the scenery is fantastic. Uh, we end up in Paris. Uh, that was our hotel. And, uh, and that's the end of the tour. So get back to you folks. Yes. Just click stop share her. There, there you go. go. All right. Um, any questions? I hope you all enjoyed that. Only a comment. Outstanding. Thank you. It was great. Thank you. Excellent. Earl, uh, I, have, I have a question. Sure, Bev. Um, did they know the name of that weather forecaster? It seems he had such a pivotal role. I'd hate for his name to not go down in yeah, history. Yeah, his name was, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I might not imagine, I mentioned it. It was uh, Captain James Stagg. And, and like I said, you know, some of us have been in the corporate ro role, you know, world where maybe you're a little bit of forward, afraid of the board of directors, but this guy was a captain. And if, if in, in an Air Force, captain's you know, just a mid-level officer. I mean, he's in the room with Eisenhower and Montgomery and Patton and, the, you know, the head of the Admiralty and all these people. And they're saying, what do you think? And, uh, you know, it was a very inexact science. You know, and the stakes were enormous. Uh, I think he's one of the great unsung uh, heroes of World War II. Or what happened to him after the war? Uh, I don't know. That's a good question. In fact, as soon as this is over, I'll probably start checking that. <laughs> Uh, Ted, uh, Ted I'd, I'd like to add a little something. I've, I've been to Normandy several times taking uh, student groups from the University of Delaware. And maybe Herb knows this. I, I think it's true. I hope it's true, but um, I can't guarantee it. But I, I'm pretty sure the last time I was there, I got a uh, brochure off uh, at the cemetery site. And uh, the brochure said that uh, when we uh, you know, built the cemetery soon after the war ended, that uh, all 48 states sent a, a certain quantity of soil and that this was mixed into the uh, soil there on the site. So that the cemetery, the French deeded that uh, territory to us and uh, it's American in that sense and then American in the sense that uh, there's US soil there. As I said, I hope that's true to be a very classy thing uh, for us to have done, and it could well be true, but maybe Herb knows better than I. I, I. I had not heard that, but I hope it's true because it's a wonderful yeah. story. Um, it is uh, war cemeteries in Europe are the um, sovereign territory of the, so yeah. that is you know, U.S. territory, so to speak. Um, so that that would be marvelous if that's what happened. Uh, Gentlemen, Dan, you're muted. I remember seeing Saving Private Ryan and wondered how anybody survived that on that uh, landing. Well, the first wave did not survive. Yeah, it did not do very well. And, uh, um, you know, the, the general came ashore and, and uh, 
gosh, I'm having a senior moment. I, his name's slipping me, but he was played by uh, Robert Mitchum in the, in the movie. But, um, you know, he, he told everybody, he said, there's going to be, there's two people on these this beach, you know, people that are dead and people that are about to be dead. So that's somebody um, named Taylor, George Taylor. And, and uh, he, uh, you know, he got people moving and, uh, you know, small units, uh, you know, set out on their own and made progress here and there. Um, one thing I've learned from, uh, you know, many of these books behind here about World War II is uh, one of the advantages the Americans had it, we encouraged uh, initiative and free thinking among our junior officers. Uh, in the German army it was very hierarchical. I mean, if, you know, if something went awry, uh, you wait. You just stopped and waited for your next set of orders. Uh, in our army, if a lieutenant said, "Gee, we're getting shot up, and I don't know what anybody's going to do," I think the best thing to do is get up, get up that hill there. Let's go, guys. That happened, and uh, so uh, it uh, one, one of the many uh, contributing factors to our success. Or, or when that room with the planning room with Churchill and, and so on, it's quite amazing. When um, that group of, of people um, looking back, Eisenhower and so on, who do you think was the, the, the real commander, the number one, who knew what to do, um, who was calling the shots there? Who did, who who really was was leading? Well, let, let me let me. Hit, that's there's actually I'd, I'd give a couple answers to that. Um, first of all, uh, I, I'm a big fan of Eisenhower, uh, both as the general and the president. Uh, but he was uh, an obscure colonel in the Pentagon at the start of World War II, um, and. Uh, Chief of Staff, uh, Army Chief of Staff George Marshall recognized that he had uh, two characteristics. Uh, first of all, he was uh, a consummate planner and uh, considered the best uh, planner, PLA and NER, in the U.S. Army. The second thing is he seemed to have the ability to have people, strong personalities of, of diverse opinions, have them get along together and play nice. Uh, people like Patton and Montgomery. And so uh, he, he uh, unlike Patton and Montgomery and MacArthur, he had not led combat troops in World War I. He was a staff officer in World War I. He never led troops in combat. Um, but uh, this, the success of this invasion, invasion was, uh, was the planning. Uh, I, I actually uh, teach courses on strategic planning and I uh, I use one of my favorite Eisenhower quotes, which was he would say, uh, it's not the plan, it's the planning. And in other words, yes, the final plan is important, but it's really the process and how you do the process. And you, you think of all the alternatives and you encourage uh, uh, skepticism and, and all those kind of things. Um, so uh, he was not an on the ground commander. I mean, on D-Day, uh, Bradley and Montgomery were the ones calling the shots. Uh, but also uh, the men on the ground at the front, like uh, Teddy Roosevelt and like the general uh, on Omaha Beach. Uh, you know, they were, they were the ones that uh, really made it work, which is really, you know, I come back to uh, as a student military history and a businessman. Uh, there's, there's a lot of similarities. You know, the, the CEO isn't, you know, is, is the planner and the thinker and the get alonger and, and uh, you know, the same thing. So I, but uh, I, most people widely think that Marshall's picking of Eisenhower is one of the shrewdest personnel moves in military history because he was not an obvious choice. I don't know if I answered your question, but. Yes, that's great. As you can tell, I can talk for hours about this stuff. <laughs> One thing I've always wondered about um, was how receptive were, were the French to this invasion? I mean, some of those farmers and the fact there were so many Germans around must have been reluctant to jump in and, you know, and help the Americans when we first showed up there. 
So what was the tenor of, of, of the French people at that time to the invasion taking place? Um, extremely supportive. There was a very active underground in Normandy. Uh, they did a lot on D-Day. Uh, and then there were citizens like the Grandries who had the, uh, the uh, cafe at Bonneville who, who, you know, first were gathering intelligence yeah. and, but also, uh, you know, helped 10 wounded and all that. Uh, and uh, they, as a courtesy, they, they pointed out to Charles de Gaulle, uh, who was the head of the French forces, that you know, we're going to bomb and shell, you know, some, some French towns and you probably have civilian casualties and all that. And he goes, if that's, he said, that's, that's just war. Uh, we need to get these bad people out of my country and you just do whatever you need to do. Um, and uh, one, one of the things on D-Day uh, is that the, the Navy was supposed to shell the beaches uh, right before the landings. And uh, they were afraid they might get too close to landing craft, so they get, adjusted their aim up a little bit and they actually um, pounded the fields behind the beach. Same with the bombers. Bombers were supposed to come over. They released about a second late. And uh, they said the result was uh, not many dead Germans, but a lot of dead cows. And, uh, I mean, it is mostly farm country. So other than those little coastal communities, you know, the civilian population was not that exposed. I'd also like to say, let's fast forward to 2015. I love the Norman people. They were so nice. They were so friendly. Uh, they, they clearly understand their economy is based on agriculture and cheese and tourism. And uh, they appreciated it. We were there and they were always polite. Uh, I've been to Paris about a half dozen times. I love Paris. It's a beautiful city, but I always say it'd be a better place if Parisians weren't there because some of them are, uh, are pretty uh, arrogant and uh, don't treat Americans very well. But uh, that was not the case in Normandy. They're just wonderful, warm people, and they appreciate what we did. Uh, they clearly understand that uh, we liberated our country. And uh, so... Say, Herb, on, there's been, there were a lot of military casualties on both the uh, Allied side and the German side. Has there been an estimate of the civilian casualties during the D-Day uh, invasion period? I'm sure there have been. I don't have um, that number. I, I know the Allied casualties on D-Day yeah. were about 7,000, which is really pretty low if you think about it. Um, but... Um, that's, um, no, no I, don't, I don't know that. You have any patent stories? <laughs> um, I, I do know that um, about the time of this tour was when uh, Bill O'Reilly's Killing Patent book came out. And uh, our tour guide totally debunked the book and all these conspiracy theories things <laughs> um, that uh, you know he was not murdered by the Russians and and uh, yeah there's always it's been suspicious because they let the soldiers who if, if you don't know Patton was fatally injured in a in a, a motor accident where a uh, army truck ran a in essence a stop sign and hit his staff car mm -hmm. um, and it was being driven by a couple of drunk soldiers who had uh, borrowed. The, borrowed the truck um, and, and they were never charged and all, but uh, according to uh, Kevin, you know, Patton said, hey, you know, these are the guys that, you know, were out there fighting the war and they're blowing off steam and that's just what soldiers do and, you know, don't do anything to them. Yeah. Was the competition between him and Montgomery as it's been shown in the movies? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, Montgomery, you know, they were both arrogant, and Montgomery was, uh, you know, very arrogant. And, and quite frankly, in retrospect, an okay general, but not a great general. Dave, did you want to ask something? Yeah, I just, <clears throat> my dad fought in the war, the Battle of the Bulge, and the personal trauma that he experienced was um, a couple of things. Number one, the Germans had been developing uh, war equipment forever. And they were tenfold 
better at making uh, great grenades, uh, guns, everything they had was, and it, it was, dad felt like he had a pea shooter compared to the Germans. And that created uh, a long period of uh, nightmares, traumas. He was in a psychiatric hospital for a while. Um, I think one of the fallout is something that we don't truly appreciate enough. And his brother was the same way, who flew an airplane and uh, almost died because the, the uh, bomb doors wouldn't open on his plane. Well, they spend three quarters of their fuel taking the bombs over. He had no way to get back. But they finally found an outhouse after they fixed the doors and that farmer's outhouse is no longer in existence because they dropped the bombs there. But I don't think we truly appreciate things like the pandemic and its effect on people's lives. And, and just, he would, only when he got into his 90s would he talk about it. So, uh, pretty, uh, it was story. very traumatic for, for my dad. The, uh, speaking of, of bombers, I, I mentioned the uh, book Wild Blue Yonder that uh, Stephen Ambrose wrote um, about George McGovern. And, and flying bombers was, those were big, heavy planes, and they did not have hydraulics. It was all manual and cables, and they had to fly in close formation, and there's there a lot of danger. But one of the, the, the most moving story is um, they, uh, they, had, they dropped their bomb load uh, over somewhere over uh, the Yugoslavia, you know, whatever we call that area now, it's a bunch of countries. But anyway, bomb hung up. So they're flying back uh, over Austria and they're in the, and they're flying over these uh, fields and they're shaking the thing and finally it lets yeah. loose and they happen to be flying at, flying over a uh, Austrian farm and there's a bunch of people down there and there's a, a barn and they hit the barn and blow it to smithereens. And after he felt for most of the rest of his life, he felt guilty uh, about that. He worried about whether he killed somebody, he uh, you know, affected somebody's livelihood and all. And uh, he was giving a, a speech in Europe and uh, an older gentleman walked up to him and said, uh, well, thank you for being here. But I want to tell you that, because um, he told the story about dropping the bomb, he was, I want to tell you that was my farm. And we were getting ready to tear that barn down, and you did me a favor. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and he had felt guilty about it for 30 years. He said, Nobody got hurt. You know, you just did some work for us. <laughs> that was a nice thing to say, even if it wasn't true. <laughs> so I have a bomber story from my uncle. He came back once and he, uh, after he got back, uh, he counted over 80 uh, anti-aircraft bullet holes in his plane, and he had a dead co-pilot. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, he, he had nightmares for years. And, um, I, you know, the trauma of war is nothing to be taken for granted. No, it's not. Uh, if, if, yeah, I mentioned the uh, tanks, uh, a, a really good book is called uh, is a Spearhead about a tank crew. And um, a, a lot of, uh, a lot of the tankers <coughs> the war, uh, were on their third or fourth tank by the end of the war because they would get hit and they would escape and they get another tank and, and uh, so on and so on. So um, it's uh, it's it's tough stuff, and yep. uh, as as I said, we should uh, we should all think about that this Memorial Day weekend uh, in between the beer and hot dogs and everything. Absolutely, great thought. Thank you. Hey Herb, uh, yes. weren't the weren't the, uh, the hedgerows around the uh, French uh, farm fields a major impediment to to 
the invasion of our troops? Uh, they were. Um, I did not cover that because it, it, it wasn't an impediment on D-Day, but as they moved inland, um, and uh, I do have a couple of pictures of them, but, uh, and that was the, the biggest allied planning failure was the hedgerows. They saw them from there and they thought they were hedges, <laughs> not like you have in your yard. Well, they're actually mounds that are about uh, 10 feet, 10 to 12 feet tall with vegetation growing out of them and a whole patchwork of them and with little narrow openings into each square. Um, you could not design a better uh, defense system uh, and it was ready made for the Germans who were the masters of, of defense. Um, and, and coming back to what Dave said about the German weapons, they clearly had the best weapons of the war, but another one was they had this machine gun that uh, was very reliable, very lightweight, fired an incredibly rapid uh, rate of fire. It fired so fast that the uh, it sounded like a zipper. You know, zzz, and uh, the, the Allied troops nicknamed it uh, Hitler's zipper. Uh, and they had a bunch of those all over the bluffs uh, of Normandy. I, I also encourage you, The Longest Day is really a documentary, I mean, but besides having practically every great actor of a generation in it, uh, it really is a good uh, description uh, of D-Day and they, they cover everything. You know, they cover Utah Beach and Omaha Beach and Ponte Hawk and, and Pegasus Bridge and all that stuff. Um, so uh, if, if you're motivated to, uh, you know, most of you have probably seen it, but uh, probably been a while. It's, it's, uh, it's great to, uh, to watch every now and then because it, re it reminds you uh, everything that happened. Yeah, the longest day, I'll just echo what you, what you said, Herb. The longest day from the mouth of a guy who was involved in, was a paratrooper on that day, my friend's dad. He said that movie was the most realistic Second World War movie that he had seen at the time. And so it's an amazing movie. And we very, well, they, very, very true to form. They did make one big mistake in that movie. And that is that in that film, and this is a mistake was in Cornelius Ryan's book, The Longest Day. Uh, they have the people getting up uh, to Point de Oak, as uh, Herb said. And uh, there are no guns there, as Herb said. But uh, the movie didn't tell you that they went back another couple of hundred, 300 yards and found the guns, which is an even greater achievement, and blew them up. And that uh, shortcoming, as I said, is in the Cornelius Ryan book, uh, where he just leaves it at that. You know, we got up here for nothing. And that's what's in the movie. And it's, uh, that's a bad scene. You know, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't give that movie as many stars as, as you others are, are giving it. But part of that's because when I served in the army, it was out on the west coast of France and they had finished filming the movie uh, in, in part on the west coast of France. I knew a couple of people who had been liaison with the movie and they had, uh, they had some not altogether favorable stories to tell about Hollywood and uh, some of the liberties they took here and there. But uh, uh, the, interestingly, the uh, students, the younger people that I'm used to teach don't like the movie at all. I mean, we all think it was great. I thought it was great with that one exception when I, when I saw it, they call it the longest, uh, the longest movie, not the longest <laughs> day, but the longest movie. Yeah. So I think uh, Saving Private Ryan would be the best D-Day movie as far as I'm concerned. Well, like I said, it's, it's it, by 1962 movie standards, it's pretty good, but it's really a documentary in, yeah. in what they're trying to portray. I mean, they did leave out that about, the other thing about Pond de Hawk that people don't realize is that but it, it, they got cut off and they were there for two days. That's true, yes. Counter -attacks. Everybody tends to kind of leave off where they destroy the guns. I, I wasn't being rude looking at my phone. I was looking at, uh, Mitchum played um, General Norma Cota, C-O-T-A. He was one of the officers who led one of the- uh, Oh yeah, right. Things. Yeah, the, the, the movie portrays him as, you know, taking all of Omaha Beach, he was one of many officers who led a key effort to get up the bluffs, um, but but that's Hollywood. Uh, Robert Mitchum was particularly unappealing in, in person on that film, so my friend said. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, and and uh, speaking of Hollywood, like I said, uh, the imitation game is, is is kind of bogus compared to what really happens. It's a fascinating story of uh, 
of, uh, you know, it, it wasn't, um, you know, four people working in a pub. It was a team of about 200 people uh, working with their own. And, uh, and, and the other interesting thing that they did there is, is, is not only about how they broke, the, how they invented really the first computer to break the code, but what they did with the intelligence once they got it. So it's, it's a great story. So like I said, if you want to have me back sometime next year, I'll be glad to tell that. So Dave, you want to say something? Yeah, I just, one interesting anecdote that dad did tell us, um, Omaha Beach had already been taken, but after he landed, uh, he, he said, the first thing I did, I got a haircut from one of the locals. <laughs> and if you, like a about it, if you think about it, they were, you know, nobody was cutting the hair of all those people. They came <laughs> over on ships that took, what, weeks? And then they were in waiting in England for weeks. And then uh, the first thing he did when he <laughs> got in <into laughs> Normandy, before the uh, pancake hand grenade, grenade started raining down from the Germans, he got a, he got a haircut. That's how <laughs> I felt last month. <laughs> yeah. uh, Our tour guide, Kevin, when he interviewed uh, the Band of Brothers guys, uh, one of them was Sergeant, I think it's Garan, was his name. He, he was kind of a wild and crazy guy. He asked each of them, tell me an interesting personal story about your war that's not related to combat. He says, well, I got wounded and uh, I woke up in the hospital and the orderly said, um, you know, you're in, you've been wounded, you're in the hospital, uh, but, uh, but we're, we're told, uh, I've been instructed to tell you that you can have uh, whatever you want for dinner, what would you like? His answer was a dry martini. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Kirk, thank you. I, we got to end it. Um, we've gone over. It's been a great presentation, Herb. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thanks for having me. I, obviously, and, uh, we were all applauding you. It was really terrific. And I've not been to Normandy, so I appreciated all those slides. And I'm glad you uh, like using a camera. So it's nice <laughs> to actually see you. Both. Come, come yeah. back next year and do a second version. I, I, I think that would fascinate you. There's more questions. Okay. And, and I, um, I, I want to publicly thank um, the team that really put together all these speakers for this uh, session. I mean, it has uniformly been a terrific um, Amen. session of, of gathering of of the Tuesday mm. Morning Fellowship. And the speakers have been terrific, very insightful and very educational. Mm. So I, I, wanted, I wanted to thank both Dave's, Goodell and Walter and Craig and Ted Strand, and I'm sure there's others who really contributed a team effort to making this a wonderful mm. season of speakers. And we'll be working for the fall season. So mm. you all come back. Here, <laughs> and, and I'd like to I'd like to say uh, now that I'm not president of the trustees anymore, um, I look forward to uh, joining your group in the fall on a regular basis. Um, I just didn't have the bandwidth uh, when I was doing that. Well, we welcome you, and you can bring any of your friends you'd like. <laughs> I will. Thanks, sir. Thank you, Herb. Right. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye, guys. Uh -huh.